Hello, welcome to Nassau Church's Youth Group Sunday service. I hope that you all had a blessed Christmas Day on Friday, and now we are up and going again, heading into 2021. And that should be very exciting, right? Hope you had a lot of good rest over this week, and now we are going to come before the Lord as always in the same spirit of Christmas in order to worship the Lord with all joy and eagerness, and of course with holiness as well. Why don't we pray and we ask for the Lord's blessing as we start this service today. Lord, we come before you now to bring gl glory and honor to you. We pray, Lord, that we will not come with hearts that are hardened or indifferent or full of so much sin that it makes us into hypocrites, Lord. That's the last thing we want to be. That if we claim to be children of God, if we claim to be Christians, then surely we should have the heart of a Christian. Those who have repented, have been humbled, have our faith in you and in the cross of Christ, and are now living a transformed godly life. That is what you have called us to be. So if that is us here today, then we pray, Lord, Continue to work within us, Holy Spirit, so that we can always grow in godliness and to always abound in joy for our God. So we pray, Lord, that you'll forgive us of our sin and allow us to come before your presence now to bring you this worship. And all this we lift up in your Son's precious name. Amen.
If you're just joining us right now, I want to welcome you to Nassung Church's youth group service. And we are glad that you are joining us here today. Thank you for setting aside your Sunday to join us for worship, which is always important because scripture commands us to be faithful, to assemble together, to set aside this day in which we honor the Lord in worship and to hear his word. So God bless you guys, and I hope you had a very Merry Christmas this year. And before we go into the sermon for today, quick reminder that you guys should be getting the Senna books very soon. These are for the month of January. So January 2021, how exciting is that? So looks like the theme of uh, January is pray for Israel. And yes, that's actually a major theme in the Bible, praying for Israel. So please remember, uh, if you haven't gotten one of these, then please request it and we'll definitely get one of these out to you. So now we are going to go into our message for today. We are going to be continuing in the book of Romans and we are going to be looking at Romans chapter 3 verses 1 through 20. So these 20 verses together. And Paul is going to be continuing to talk about this whole issue of how everybody in the world is sinful. Both Jewish people, Gentile people, no matter where you are, no matter what time period. So this chapter we're going to be looking at for today's sermon is going to be Paul's last discussion on universal sinfulness before he talks about how it is we're saved. So that's the topic of today's message that we're going to be looking at today. And before we look at it, let's pray to God and ask for his blessing and ask for him to teach us his word. Jesus, we thank you for this word that you have given to us. And we pray, Lord, that we will listen and that it will be something that will change and transform us, Lord so that it can be life transforming, so that it can convict us and drive us closer to you, Lord. So it can teach us, Lord, that all of us are sinful and that there's no such thing as a good, righteous person who can get to heaven on his own, but that we all need God's grace to be saved. And you do that through our faith, our faith in Christ. So we pray, Holy Spirit, Speak to us right now and teach us what your word says. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So once again, guys, we are on chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. So this is Paul now uh, continuing to discuss the issue of why do we need the gospel? It's, it's because all of us are born with sin, and that's why we sin every single day and do all this crazy, evil, wicked, selfish stuff all the time. So that's why there's no such thing as a person who can live exactly like Jesus did, like really perfect, really pure all throughout his life. All of us are affected by sin. And we see the same story here in chapter three. So this is how Paul begins, because now Paul is going to address some of these questions that um, the skeptics have, you know, like since Paul is teaching all this stuff about nobody could get saved by their good works or religious rituals. So of course, you know, there's going to be people who are going to put forth like objections and question Paul and, you know, try to doubt Paul. And so let's see what questions that they're asking. In chapter three, verse one, it says, then what advantage has the Jew or what is the benefit of circumcision? So basically, the questions that the opponents are asking now is, okay, well, if you're saying the Jewish people can get saved, even if they have the law and, you know, God made a covenant blessing with them in the Old Testament, then is there any advantage to being Jewish? Like, is circumcision, is it beneficial at all? Are you saying it's completely useless? So now what Paul is saying is this, great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. So Paul was saying to them, even though, of course, you're not saved by all your works and your rituals, but you guys are still blessed in many ways because you were the first to receive God's, you know, God's word, which is the Old Testament. So that's a blessing because God basically revealed himself to Israel so that they know how to get right with God, while everybody else in the world didn't really have such a blessing. And in many ways, guys, if you grew up in the church as well, you are blessed as well. Do you know why? Because you have teachers, you have parents who brought you the Bible and were teaching you what's in the Bible so that you can get saved, so that you know exactly what you need to do to go to heaven when you die. You know, not a lot of people or a lot of people around the world don't have access to it. 
So that's the same thing that Paul was saying right here to the Jewish people that you guys are blessed because you have received God's word. So you have major responsibility to obey it and to also teach it to other people correctly. And that's our responsibility as a church as well. So Paul continues and says, What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief did not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? Oh, may it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. You see, now the skeptics are saying, well, you know, if all these Jewish people are going to be condemned to hell because they didn't believe in Jesus, so does that mean that God failed in his promises? Because if you guys remember, in the Old Testament, God promised to Abraham that his... Um, that he's going to have all these descendants and that they're going to claim like, you know, a land, which is the land of Israel. And then they're going to be a blessing to the Gentile nations. So he promised the, the uh, prosperity and the salvation of Israel. But then, you know, the, the skeptics are saying, well, then is God not going to keep his promises if all these Jewish people are going to go to hell? Well, the thing is, this thing says God is still faithful to keep his promises. But it doesn't mean that every single Jewish person who has ever lived is going to go to heaven. Of course, you know, at the end, you know, you guys know in the book of Revelation, God does save Israel and he basically will come back and rule in Israel. So he's still going to keep his promises to Israel. But then he's telling us that doesn't mean that individual people will not be judged. So that's a that's really a message for us as well because you know we could um, grow up in the church and we can think oh because you know we are in a Christian family or we're in this great Christian church that that God has to be obligated to save us. That's not true because God can still judge you if you do not believe the gospel. If you die in your sins and you have not repented then you are still held accountable for all of your sins. But look at what else these uh, opponents are saying. In verse 5, But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be, for otherwise how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil, that good may come. Their condemnation is just. Wow, this is a very interesting question. So now the skeptics are asking Paul right over here, well, you know, if, um, if Israel pretty much, you know, died, or all these Jewish people, like, die in unbelief, like, so what does this all mean? That God is just using it all for his glory? And Paul was saying right here that that's not true. I mean, in some ways it is true that God uses all these evil things to bring glory to himself, but it doesn't make him evil. It doesn't, you know, change his character whatsoever. In fact, all these opponents were saying, well, you know, if God uses all these evil things in order to bring glory to himself, that means we should do evil as a group so that we can continue to bring glory to God. Paul was saying, that's not true. We should never, ever abuse grace because some people were thinking, okay, well, if we are saved by grace, then that means we could continue to sin, right? Because God is going to always forgive us. Well, it's true that if we fall into sin and, you know, we earnestly ask God for forgiveness and wanting to get right, of course he is going to forgive us. But the that attitude of, you know, we're just going to sin, you know, without caring and because we know God's got our back and, you know, that's not the attitude we're supposed to have because that's the attitude of an unbeliever. If you have that attitude today, then that's not the attitude you're supposed to have. In fact, you're supposed to be broken over your sin. You're supposed to say, Lord, I am so, so, I'm so in pain over my sin. I don't want to sin against you. I want to turn from my sin and I want to just follow you and to be led by the Spirit. That's what he's calling us to do. 
So the, so the whole point <clears throat> behind the first eight verses is this, is that God is faithful. God is going to judge. He makes covenant promises in the Bible, but at the same time, he's still going to judge us if we do not believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So obviously, Paul was answering these objections from these Jewish people who were saying that his theology didn't make sense, but Paul is saying it does make sense. Because God, even, you know, he's faithful, and even though you might think that this whole thing that I'm teaching you is very skewed, he will judge. That is the whole point of it. He's still righteous, and he is going to judge. Now we see the condemnation of these sinners in verse 9. It says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. So now Paul is turning the question on themselves because the church might think, oh, we're so much better than the Jewish people. But Paul is saying, no, that's not true. Don't think that you guys in the church were able to get saved because you guys are just so much better, which is the reason why you were able to believe in the gospel. He says you guys have also been affected by sin, which is why you guys need the gospel as well. And that is why he says there is none righteous. Did you hear Paul? He says there is none righteous, not even one. Out of all these people who have ever lived, he says there is none righteous. Whoa. See in verse 11, he says, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Wow. Nobody in the world understands. Nobody seeks after God. So this is what would happen if God were to leave everybody to just kind of do their own thing. It says that nobody would be seeking after God. And even if some of them kind of did, it wouldn't be the real God. It would be some sort of idol. That's what we've been seeing throughout history. Why? Because they have all been infected by sin. That's why in verse 12 it says, All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. See, God, when he created us, he created us so that we can do good. We can love him, we can serve him, we can be holy. But yet, the moment we fell into sin, we became useless to God. So if we decide we don't want to take up Jesus' offer of salvation but continue on in our sinful lifestyle, there's really nothing left he can do with us. We have no place in heaven. We're useless. We have no purpose to God. So that's why, you know, Jesus said that dead branches, if they're useless, they're just tossed into the fire. And in the same way, that's what happens to believers or people who say to be believers, but they're not really believers. They'll eventually be cast into God's hell forever. Paul says, there is none who does good, not even one. What does Paul mean by that when he says, there is none who do good, not even one? See, this is what happens if God were to leave everybody to do their own thing without intervening and you know showing his grace upon certain people to save them. He says, if that were to happen, if I were to leave people just to do their own thing in life, the things that they would do would not be good. Because even if they do some of these things that we think are good, like helping old ladies across the street or giving a dollar to somebody who's homeless or things like that, God says that if you don't believe in Christ, if you're not serving God, then you are doing it with a different motive, which is not God-centered. That's why it's not good before God. It's all selfish. That is why he's saying there is nobody in the world who is good enough to earn eternal life. In verse 13, he continues and says, Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. See, you can tell if somebody is a uh, unbeliever by sometimes hearing, or most of the times hearing their speech, because based on the way people talk, you'll know what their spiritual condition is like. I mean, I see them all the time. They love to curse, they love to use profanity, they love to use God's name in vain. Um, they always use their tongues to flatter people, to manipulate people, to curse people, to slander people, to tell lies, because it all comes from a spiritually evil, sinful, wicked heart. 
That is why if we are in Christ, if we've been saved, we have believed God has washed us internally so that we just don't really want to, you know, curse or to lie or to use our tongues to mislead people because that's all a condition of those who are dead in their sins. But then Paul continues and says, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So this is also how sinners are known is that a lot of them, if they don't have any restraint from the family or from the government, they're going to go out and they're going to murder people. People who disagree with them or get in their way or get them upset. They, they said that history is marked by all these murders. People are quick to shed blood. People are quick to take lives. Yet even today, look at what happens. We have private murders. We see murders in war. We see abortion happening. We see like a lot of murders going on right now. This is all a condition of the sinful human heart. And do you know why these people are doing it? Because according to verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. It is a dangerous thing if you live with no fear of God in your eyes. Because all you're doing is testing God and you're racking up more, more, more punishment on the day of judgment. So now Paul tells us in these last two verses, he tells us how we know that we're sinful. In verse 19, he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. See, we know that we're sinful because God's law, like the Ten Commandments, for example, it shows us that we're all sinful. You shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery. If we look at ourselves under God's law, we know that we have sinned and we don't deserve heaven. Even if we break the law one time, we're doomed. Jesus says that if you've ever hated somebody before, you've already committed murder with them. If you lusted for somebody, you've already committed adultery with them. The law goes so deep in our hearts that nobody could claim to be innocent or righteous. Everybody is condemned under God's law. That is why he says everybody in the world is condemned and on their way to hell. That's why we all need Christ. In verse 20, he says, Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. He's saying nobody in the world can be made right by trying to follow the law. Because the law is not going to save us. I mean, a lot of people try to follow the law in order to be saved. You know, the Jewish people try to follow the law. Even to a lot of degrees, like Muslims try to follow the law and Catholics try to follow the law. All these works in order to be saved. But Paul is saying there is no amount of works that will justify you before God because the law is not meant to cleanse you, to wash you. The law is meant to reveal how sinful you are so that you can see your need for a savior. It's supposed to say you are sinful, you need a savior, but here is the savior right here. And praise God for that, that Jesus Christ is the Savior. We deserve hell because we broke the law so many times. Lying, stealing, adultery, covetousness, pride, you know, all this wickedness. What hope do we have? Yet our hope is in God who sent His Son Jesus Christ to fulfill the law for us by living out that law perfectly. You know what? When God looks at the world, He says there is no one righteous. That's everybody except one person and that is Jesus Christ who is fully God and also fully man and a perfect man too who kept the law perfectly so that he can earn our righteousness and then also dying on the cross to die the death that we deserve as a substitute so that when we repent of our sins and place our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior <clears throat> we are saved it's as simple as that because, of course, to get into heaven, it requires righteousness. It does require works to get into heaven. But the question is, whose works will get us into heaven? Is it going to be our works or the works of another person? And that is what the gospel is about. Because it is, 
a gospel about how the works of another person, Jesus Christ, who kept the law perfectly, earned our place in, in heaven. And all we need to do is to have our faith in it, to trust in it. So then when we place our faith in Christ, when we trust in Christ, you know what happens? God takes the works of Christ and he credits that to us as if we had done those works. So basically that's his righteousness given to us so that that earns our place into heaven. Because heaven is not given to us for free. There, there's a price that's paid for it. A price to pay off the sin debt, but also the price to give God righteousness that we don't have. So that is why if you are here today and you need that righteousness, then today you can get it. If you need the works of Christ to cover you because you don't want to trust in your own works, then trust in the works of Christ by faith. Because you know the law, it exposes us all as sinners. So obviously we have no good works. We have no righteousness to save us. But when the law is measured on the life of Christ, do you know what the law sees? Perfect, sinless, righteous, no sin whatsoever in that man's life. And that is the righteousness we need. And Christ says, I can give it to you. I can give it to you in exchange for your sins, but you just need to repent and turn to me and have faith and you can get it today. So I want us all to pray and I want us all to remember this message today and to think about his word. So Lord, we pray right now to think about this very important message because in it we see why it is that we are condemned because we are sinful. But you also show us the hope that we have if we turn to Christ and believe in the gospel that we can be made righteous, that we can be justified and saved. So we pray now, Lord, that if there's anybody here watching who need your salvation, that you will bring it to them today, that you will bless them with your righteousness that comes by faith. Let none of us leave this YouTube video service in a state where we're still not right with you. I pray, Lord, that you will save somebody today. And for the rest of us, Lord, I pray that this message will remind us of who we once were so that we can continue to stay on track of what we are today. So let us never take sin for granted. Let us never um, fall to sin, but be on guard. And if we do follow the law, let us not do it to earn our salvation, but rather do it, Lord, as children of God who have already been saved. And we're doing it as an act of worship to you. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you so much for watching this video and to tuning in to our service for today. Once again, please join us on Friday at 7 p.m. as we'll continue our Friday night Bible studies going through, uh, I believe it's, is it the new, yes, going through the Senna book. And God bless all of you guys, and I will see you this coming Friday.